Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed for the very first, I guess, well, I shouldn't say it's the very first video. I've already made a video on the channel explaining what the Monitors Unboxed channel is all about, some of the content that we'll be doing on this very channel. But today we're going to be making the first, I guess, bit of bonus second channel content that you can expect from Monitors Unboxed, and that is a Q&A video, as I mentioned in that other video that's up on Monitors Unboxed right now. Um, a lot of the time when we get Q&A questions for the Hardware Unbox main channel, we get a fair percentage of monitor related questions, but we tend to stick to the things that we know that most of our hard run box audience is going to be interested in, so CPU and GPU content. But I've been saving a few of the monitor questions from our Patreon and Floatplane members that have been leaving those questions for us in our Discord chat for this very first Monitors Unbox Q&A. So we'll be doing these fairly regularly. We'll ask questions of you guys in either the comments on these videos or community tab on Monitors Unboxed or wherever the place may be. So Rest assured there will be more of these videos, but I guess let's just get started into some of the questions that we've received over the last couple of months. First question here, is there any feasible way to get a true HDR experience on PC with current technology? Do you expect to see this improve in the near future? So, I mean, yeah, you definitely can get a true HDR experience on PC with current technology. There are some monitors that will deliver a true HDR experience, or at least what I would class as true HDR. Earlier this year, we reviewed the Alienware AW3423DW QD OLED monitor. That definitely delivers a true HDR experience. And there have been monitors in the past with sufficient mini LED backlighting zones, ASUS PG32UQX being one of those examples. So yeah, it, it has been possible to get true HDR experience. It, it's just been typically very expensive. The Even the QD OLED from Alienware costs well over $1,000, which it's a good deal. That monitor is a good deal, don't get me wrong. but it's still relatively expensive. So I do expect those sorts of things to improve in the near future. I think the second half of this year, we're gonna be getting a lot more HDR monitors. It sounds like a lot of the panel manufacturers from all the major brands, so LG, BOE, Samsung maybe, I think they've sold most of the LCD monitor making. All those companies, you know, uh, Inelux, all those are making more panels with mini LED backlighting zones, LCDs, and then of course there's more OLEDs coming to market as well. So I think we will see a better future for true HDR monitors, hopefully starting sort of second half of this year. Could you explain a little about the various color spaces referenced in the monitor reviews, differences between them, how each is typically used, etc.? Well, this is probably worth its own video, sort of a dedicated video to discuss color spaces, probably something that we will do on this new Monitors Unbox channel at some point. But I'll just quickly go through the main color spaces that we talk about. So the main one that we're interested in and the main one that we measure against is sRGB. And what sRGB is and why we make it the default for our testing is that it's the default for Windows. So if you're hooking up your monitor to a Windows PC, the Windows PC is outputting data in an sRGB format. It's expecting that you will have a display that can show sRGB content, which is why I think it's sort of the most important color space for SDR usage, which is what makes up the majority of content that you'll be viewing on a PC today. Things like web pages, videos, videos may be slightly different, but you know, applications, all of those, everything is encoded meant for sRGB. So sRGB you can sort of think of as your regular SDR gamut. And that has certain features, certain color primaries, which limits the color space to certain color levels. It uses a D65 white point, which means that the white point is around 6500K ish. Um, it's not quite that, but it's very similar to 6500K. And it also specifies a certain gamma curve, which is what we also use for testing. We want to make sure that all of those areas match up. So the sRGB color space was a, derived from the Rec 709 color space, which was originally designed for HDTV. So when they were coming up with the, the SDR HDTV standard, they came up with Rec. 709, which set a lot of the parameters like the color primaries, like the D65 white point, and also a, a gamma that's similar to sRGB. When Microsoft came up with sRGB, they decided to modify some of the parameters to make sRGB more suitable for office use. Rec. 709 is a bit more suitable for say, home TV use, but either way, both, both of those color spaces are very similar and are basically the standard for SDR content today. The other two color spaces that we often talk about, one of them is Adobe RGB. Adobe RGB is designed for print applications. Adobe created that color space to 
roughly approximate what CMYK printers could do, except in an RGB color format that makes sense for computer monitors. So Adobe RGB is meant for people working with photography, with print, with illustrations, and those sorts of things. So it's important for people using applications like Photoshop, Illustrator, those sorts of things where the final product that you're gonna be seeing is gonna be printed. Then you get to DCI-P3, which is the other main wide gamut spec that we talk about. DCI-P3 is a cinema standard. DCI is a, a cinema consortium. So DCI-P3 is kind of the wide color space that's designed for use with cinemas and projectors, those sorts of things. So Adobe RGB relative to sRGB, so relative to a standard color space, extends primarily into the green region. So I'd say it's green dominant versus SDR and sRGB, while DCI-P3 is more red dominant. So again, it extends a little bit further into greens, but more so on the red side. So those are really the two main wide color gamuts that we talk about, Adobe RGB, DCI-P3. We're still getting to the stage where monitors can cover one or both of those color spaces. And then encompassing all of those is the very wide Rec 2020, which has been designed as sort of a future looking color gamut for HDR content. So a lot of the time today, Content makers will master their content more with DCI-P3 in mind because they know that not all displays will be able to show Rec 2020 colors. But eventually some point down the line, we will see proper Rec 2020 coverage, which has much larger range of colors into reds, greens, and blues uh, than even the DCI-P3 and Adobe RGB color spaces. So those are basically sort of a very brief summary of those three or four Four, I think in the end, maybe five color spaces that we talk about in reviews and where they're used. Obviously there's many more color spaces, but for computer use, I think those are the main important ones. Alvin asks, how would you calibrate a monitor for gaming? Many gamers prefer vibrant colors, so accuracy is usually not a top priority. What about white point and black level contrast, especially monitor features like black stabilizer? And there's another part to this question which I'll answer in a moment as well, but let's talk about calibrating a monitor for gaming. now. When I normally think about calibrating a monitor, I think about trying to make the colors accurate. So even for games, game makers, game developers have an artistic vision for their games, especially games where that matters, like say story-driven games, single player titles, things like your Assassin's Creed, Red Dead Redemption, those sort of games, you know, the developer has a look that they want to use for the game. They have a certain mood, a certain lighting that they want to use. And provided that you've set the games in-game you know, gamma controls correctly with those, you know, you've often seen those sliders where they try and make you only just see an image or something like that. Provided that you've got those colors, you know, those settings down pat, then, you know, there's an intended look for the game. So I think calibrating is still useful for gaming monitors in that you can get the intended look of the game, how the, you know, the content creator has made the game. So I would still recommend just calibrating your monitor in a normal way for gaming so that you are experiencing the game as it's intended. However, as this comment rightly says, lots of people like to do other things with their gaming monitor, like vibrant colors, like you know increasing the black levels so that you can see enemies easier by using black stabilizer features and those sorts of things. And, you know, all of that is kind of a, a personal preference thing. There's no reason why you can't use vibrant colors for normal content as well. It doesn't have, just have to be games. You could do it for videos as well. But at that point, you're not really calibrating the monitor. You're more just optimizing it to the experience that you want to see. And I think there's certainly some benefits to doing that for gaming, for games like competitive shooters, where you need to really see enemies in the dark more easily. Features like Black Stabilizer make sense for using, but typically those are only going to be for certain multiplayer games, and you're not really concerned with accuracy. You're more just concerned with changing the settings so that you can get the best competitive advantage. It's kind of a, I'd sort of see it as a different sort of thing to calibration. Also on the topic of calibration, is it at all possible to perform a rough calibration without specialized hardware? Main concern, matching monitors in a multi-screen setup. So I've got this question a couple of times before as well, and let's be honest, it's pretty difficult. The whole goal of calibration and how you perform a calibration is that you need a reference device. So you need something that's gonna tell you what the colors should look like. So we use the monitor calibration tools, the hardware tools, because those can record accurately the color that's being displayed and then match it to the color coordinates of what the color should be and that's all done in the software on your computer. 
So it means that we can effectively use those tools to compare it to a known software reference. But if you're doing it with that specialized hardware, you kind of have to match it by eye to something else, which can be quite difficult. You'd either need something like a known, really well calibrated monitor that you can put side by side the monitor you're calibrating by eye and go through a very tedious process of adjusting some of the settings and so forth. But even then, you know, you're not gonna be able to create an ICC profile or anything like that via this sort of rough calibration process. It really is something that needs a tool to be done. For things like matching monitors in a multi-screen setup, that's generally easy if you've bought two of the same monitor. If you have one monitor that you set as sort of your reference main monitor and you adjust the other settings to match that primary monitor, uh, you'll probably get pretty close. But it does become more difficult when you've got two monitors that don't match. And I think that's where a lot of people wanna do these sorts of rough calibrations. And yeah, you could sort of say, okay, my primary monitor, I want the colors to all look like that. Let's ignore whether it's super accurate to any color standards or not. We just want to make them look the same. Again, you can mess around with the OSD settings, but even then the OSD settings may not be sufficient. Oftentimes monitors do not have fine enough gamma controls. So you may not be able to get the same gamma performance from one monitor as another monitor. And of course, color spaces may be different. Maybe one monitor has an sRGB mode, another monitor doesn't which can complicate all those sorts of things. So I always recommend for sort of rough calibrations, yeah, you can do a little bit, but if you're ever concerned about this, you're probably better off just hiring a dedicated calibration tool and running it through and going from there. The Alienware AW3423DW review highlighted the impact that ambient lighting and reflections can have. Besides repositioning the monitor or lights, are there any ways to adjust for ambient lighting, for example, setting slash calibration? How about choosing light bulbs with certain color temperatures? So things like lighting and reflections, it's more of a hardware issue with the specific panel, and this doesn't always apply specifically to this Alienware monitor. Lots of other panels deal with reflections differently. But no, there's not really anything you can do from a calibration standpoint to minimize reflections. It's just how the monitor panel works. It's not really something you can calibrate for necessarily. Um, in terms of this specific monitor, I found that changing the light bulbs, color temperatures, those sorts of things, doesn't really make too much of an impact. Um, whether I was using an incandescent light around like 3200K, so like a warm yellow, or whether I was using studio lights, which are more you know cool white, 5500K sort of level, uh, it doesn't make too much difference in terms of the ambient light reflection. It is gonna change the tone of the reflections, obviously, um, but no, it doesn't really make too much of a difference, unfortunately. Um, the main thing you can do with these monitors really is just to adjust the positioning of all the lights in your rooms, trying to get them as far behind the monitor as you possibly can, and that will uh, have a much greater impact on the performance that you see from those products. When displays have an adaptive sync range of frame rate X to 2.4X, why do they ever have trouble with response times at low refresh rates? Can't they just show the same frame a couple of times, receive a new frame, and then show that a couple of times? Why does turning down the overdrive setting make this work better? Hmm, yes, very uh, interesting question. So monitors and the PCs that run these monitors do already do what you're suggesting with showing frames twice. That's a feature called low frame rate compensation or LFC, and it typically only applies below the monitor's minimum refresh rate. So if you've got a monitor that's say 48 to 144 hertz, if you're playing a game or something at 38 hertz, it's then gonna double that into the range, which is gonna allow you to play games smoothly without the vsync on slash off issues that you get from running with that adaptive sync enabled. So monitor manufacturers already do this. I guess the question is more around, let's say you've got a refresh rate that's in the range that could be doubled. So in my 48 to 144 hertz example, we could be say playing at 60 hertz, you know, why isn't that doubled to 120 hertz where 120 hertz can often have better response time performance than 60 hertz. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, firstly, it's complicated, <laughs> it's complicated. So LFC, while it is a very good feature, a very useful feature, it does have its drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks that LFC has is in terms of, you can get some micro stuttering if your frame rate is fluctuating significantly. So if you're constantly moving in and out of using LFC, there can be some minor differences to things like input lag and, and you know, input lag is really a thing that impacts the smoothness of a game, uh, which can be undesirable. And without going into a big explanation of why that's the case, LSE isn't 
the best technique for using with really high fluctuations in frame rate, which is why most manufacturers want to have their minimum frame rate low enough that most gamers are not really going to encounter it too often. Most people will want to be playing at 60 FPS plus. So by setting the refresh rate minimum, I guess, below that, you're kind of mostly going to be in this refresh rate range. Of course, then that comes with the other drawback, which is most monitors perform worse at lower refresh rates. So you're kind of taking away from the stuttering issue, improving that, not that I'm saying it stutters, it's more micro stutters potentially, and moving that more into response time issues. So it is a bit of a balancing act there. And yeah, I guess that's kind of the main reason. As for why does turn down the overdrive setting make this work better? Um, overdrive, yeah, it's overdrive needs to be optimized for many different things. It's not just for the certain level of transition. It's not just for the type of transition that you're doing, what sort of gray to gray you're doing or whatever. It also has to be optimized for each refresh rate. And often what monitor manufacturers don't do is optimize their overdrive settings per refresh rate. So they don't include variable overdrive. So when you don't have variable overdrive, typically turning down the overdrive settings improves the performance at 60 Hertz because monitor makers tend to only optimize for the highest refresh rate setting. So if you've got a 144 Hertz monitor, the OEM is usually going, oh, let's optimize our overdrive for 144 Hertz, we'll get it looking nice. And then they forget all the other refresh rates. So by the time you get down to playing at 60 Hertz, you're trying to implement overdrive settings that are optimized for a totally different refresh rate. Now, why those settings don't work at 144 Hertz and then 60 Hertz is a, another topic of its own, probably worth its an entire video going and talking about that. Scan out times are different. The you know the certain settings that they use as part of the overdrive process, the level of overdrive they use for frame one versus frame two can be very different. It's a whole big topic as to why that's the case, but I guess it is just a fundamental aspect of monitors at the moment. So yes, they could do a better job sometimes of duplicating 60 to 120 hertz. Some monitors do that, some don't. But generally speaking, I think the way that monitor manufacturers do use these technologies is mostly the best way of going about it. And then ideally, if you can implement variable overdrive as well, that improves things further. With OLEDs, do you think it will start making sense to test the response times of the RGB and possibly W subpixels separately? So I actually did this recently with a monitor that I wasn't really testing for review or anything. I was just doing some calibrations and stuff. And first of all, the data isn't that interesting. The RGB and W subpixels, pretty similar. It's not really worth talking about too much. And the reason for this is that a lot of OLEDs don't actually use different organic LED materials for each of the different colors. I, I believe there was some experimentation in the early days of OLEDs of using different materials to emit red, green, and blue light. But the way that a lot of modern OLEDs work is that they're just one OLED diode and effectively they are then filtered into the different colors. So if you've got a QD OLED, for example, all of the OLEDs in that, or all the OLED subpixels in that monitor, they're all blue pixels. And then they use the quantum dots to filter it into red and green as well. So all of the subpixels are the same color. They're effectively the same diode, but then they're just getting filtered into the different you know, levels, the different colors, so to speak. And similar with the RGBW panels from uh, LG, I believe they're also all effectively the same subpixel, which then get filtered into the different colors. And you do see some differences in OLED subpixel sizes, depending on how effective the filtration technology is. So complicated design process to get those things really dialed down. But ultimately at the end of the day, the technology for each of the subpixels tends to be very similar, in which case we don't really see too much of a response time difference. Like sports stations making logos partially transparent to benefit OLED longevity, what steps do you hope Microsoft and Apple would take to offer more OLED friendly features in their operating systems, like taskbars where the colors slightly change every few minutes? Do you anticipate anything happening in this regard before OLED monitors are a thing for desktop? So, well, I don't expect Apple to do too much because almost their entire desktop ecosystem is built around LCD tech. Mini LED LCDs is what they use for their laptops and I believe all their desktop monitors are LCD as well. So I don't expect that to be a major thing that Apple will concern themselves with. They always, generally speaking, only care about their own products. With Microsoft, I mean, there's already some OLED features that benefit that technology, things like dark mode, things like auto hiding the taskbar. I think it could benefit, I guess, some users to have maybe a feature that you could enable in the display settings, like an OLED mode 
that automatically enables dark mode, automatically enables auto hiding the taskbar, maybe several other settings like you know integrating a screensaver, those sorts of things. I think I think Microsoft and Windows could benefit from a feature like that. But ultimately, there's not a lot of things that could be done to further improve OLED longevity with productivity apps, especially because you can't you can't really change the position of the icons in the apps that you're using. You don't want to be using Photoshop where one day all the icons are in a different position because you're worried about burning in your OLED monitor. You kind of need to have the icons in the same position so you can develop that muscle memory to make using the apps really efficient. So I think just implementing things like dark mode, like maybe introducing more transparencies, auto hiding the taskbar and hiding unnecessary static elements would benefit. But the features that they've got tend to be very fairly effective, especially when combined with modern OLED uh, technologies like pixel refreshes and pixel shifting, which are built into the monitors themselves. How much do you think recommendations affect pricing and for how long? For example, Tim recommended several monitors in a recent video. Do you expect the top picks to get more expensive relative to other offerings? How much so? When would this take effect and for how long? Um, it's not really something that I've experienced or seen too much of in terms of monitors getting a recommendation and the price going up immediately or there being a price hike. Some monitor brands can do things like introductory pricing where they price a monitor fairly cheap and then that's only a, a price for a short time and then it goes back to the normal MSRP, but that doesn't happen too often. I think with monitors, the main thing that we see is more availability concerns. If we've recommended a product, sometimes it does go out of stock quite easily, um, which can be an issue for people that want to buy that monitor and they might not have seen the video straight away. Um, so that's something that more what we've seen. I think pricing tends to be just dictated more by companies trying to compete in the market, trying to have the most competitive products and those sorts of things. Um, and pricing does tend to change throughout the year. Sometimes we talk about a monitor at one price and then the price is cheaper the next month. We talk about it at one price, the price is more expensive the next month. That's just the general way those sorts of markets play out. So yeah, I don't think the recommendations affect pricing, but they definitely have affected availability at times. So yeah, you tend to want to get in early when we're recommending monitors that are worth buying. Besides choosing settings and calibrating a monitor, are there any changes to ambient light conditions, say if you weren't sitting outdoors, that could be made to make the most of the viewing experience? So, uh, some monitor, well, monitor standards, I should say color space standards, specify ambient light level conditions. It depends on the standard. You can obviously look up all that information if you really want to, but a lot of the time, you know, if it's an office standard, they might specify, say, a certain number of lumens of, of light or, or whatever the case is. So for those specific standards, if you really wanted to get it down to the very minute details of the spec, you could look up the ambient lighting condition information that you're supposed to be using. But most of the time, you know, the ambient light conditions, so long as you're not using crazily different, you know, t color temperatures for your lights, then generally speaking, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, you know, some people have liked situations where they can change the lighting depending on the time of day for their mood related situations um, using programs like flux or built-in things on their monitor themselves to do that not a huge fan of those technologies but all those things obviously you know can affect the conditions of the monitor but for me the most important thing for ambient lighting is really to optimize the positioning of the lights and this is something we talked about earlier with the alienware question about reflections for that monitor it really does matter where your light sources are in the room I tend to find that the best way to cut down on reflections is to simply have your lights behind the monitor. So if you've got a monitor and then you're reflecting light off say the wall that's behind the monitor, that can be a really effective way to more generally light a room while cutting down on reflections because the you know the light that's coming into the monitor on the panel side is going to be a lot more diffuse, a lot dimmer than the light that would be coming from say a harsh light directly pointed at the screen, which can often create those annoying halos, or in the case of that Alienware monitor, reducing the black levels. So from my perspective, yeah, I think optimizing the positions of your lights is an important factor of setting up your setup to be optimal. Obviously for some people, it's you know, not gonna be possible if the lights are fixed into the ceiling or you've got a window in a certain location, can't exactly change those things. But yes, optimizing the position and location of lights can make a difference. And the final question for today, do you find that 8-bit plus FRC is similar for content consumption to a 10-bit panel? Specifically for instances such as color banding. As someone who has looked at a lot of monitors, is FRC effective? 
yes, yes, it is effective, especially for 8-bit panels. I think 6-bit plus FRC getting up to 8-bit can be a little dicey, but 8-bit plus FRC, I tend to find to be very similar to a native 10-bit panel. Uh, can be quite hard to distinguish the difference. Now, there are some circumstances where you've got very harsh gradients or very minor changes between one color and another color where FRC is going to struggle, in which case the native 10-bit performance is going to be better. But 8-bit plus FRC emulating 10-bit is a step up on just regular 8-bit in terms of how it deals with color gradients and banding and that sort of thing, especially if the actual input to the monitor is a true 10-bit signal, which it then can put into its 8-bit plus FRC algorithm. So I don't think the, there's much of a need for native 10-bit panels you know, over 8-bit plus FRC. I don't think it's something that's worth spending money on unless you are a true color professional, someone that needs a extremely high-end monitor for color work, uh, in which case 10-bit may be important to you. But for most people, 8-bit plus FRC is fine. It is very effective. It works just fine. So that, that's what I would say. And that's it for the very first monitor Q&A on Monitors Unboxed. I hope you guys like this video and just some going through some of the Q&A questions that our Patreon and Floatplane members have asked us over the last couple of months. If you do have more things that you want to ask me about in terms of monitors or upgrades or upcoming technology, then we will have more opportunities to do so in the future. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.